Great. Well, welcome, everyone. I hope you can all you can all hear me. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many of you too. Um, I um, and I apologise in advance. I know there are one or two real experts on some of the characters I'm going to be talking about in the in the um, in the audience. So um, if I make anything up, well, uh, uh, I apologise in advance. Um, I'm going to talk about three or actually four uh, characters who, uh, whose expeditions or whose efforts affected Latin America or were affected by Latin America. Um, and um, just really because I found them fascinating over the years. And of course, half an hour isn't anything like enough time to do any of them justice. Um, but I thought you might find it interesting. And just um, before we begin, I thought I'd just say, um, reiterate that uh, if you'd like to ask a question during uh, what uh, during my chat, uh, sorry, my talk, um, please do use the chat sort of facility, which um, uh, hopefully you will find. And, um, and then I can read it at the end. I won't be able to read it properly as I'm going along uh, because uh, I don't know, it really confuses my screen when I try and do that. Um, but maybe Sue will shout to me across the office uh, if anyone uh, picks me up on anything. And don't forget also, if, um, if you want to save anything that's put into the chat, you can do using the three little dots. And as I said before, please mute yourself unless you have a burning need to ask a question and can't find the chat or something like that. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to go in chronological order with my uh, characters. And I'm going to start with, uh, with Alexander von Humboldt. Um, but of course, uh, Europeans have been visiting Latin America for a long time. And I've skipped over all those early ones, like Magellan and people like that. And we've ended up firmly in the 19th century, um, or just in the 19th century, actually, um, because um, uh, Humboldt was, was at the end of the 18th, really. Um, and uh, Humboldt himself was, was inspired by the writings of Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, whose quotation this is, uh, it's quite a colourful one and a flowery one because he was trying to persuade the UK government to finance another trip, I think, at the time and develop the colony of, of uh, El Dorado and all these sort of things. Anyway, uh, it's, it's a fascinating read, his book, um, that little pamphlet all about uh, present day Guyana. Um, Alexander von Humboldt was born in um, what is now Prussia. Um, uh, what, sorry, what was then Prussia? Um, and in 1769, so a year before Beethoven, as I think I said in my email. Um, and he knew many of the same characters that, that Beethoven would have known. In fact, Goethe and, and Schiller, Schiller uh, wrote uh, The Ode to Joy, and uh, which Beethoven then set, uh, which makes such an important part of his uh, Ninth Symphony. Um, so that puts you in the time frame. Uh, he was really a uh, uh, an early environmentalist. He was just interested, in fact, he himself said he was interested in everything. Um, he, he, just an example of that, he spent um, 40 minutes, uh, when he heard Brunel was going to put a tunnel under the Thames, um, um, Humboldt was fascinated by this and spent uh, 40 minutes in the tunnel at the bottom of the Thames, just to see what it would be like in a, in a diving bell. Um, so, uh, sorry, not in a diving bell, not, not in the tunnel. Um, but his Latin American um, uh, expedition was really inspired by a Frenchman called La Condamine, um, who did an early trip to Latin America, um, crossed the continent, came right down uh, the Amazon, um, and um, 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 brought back to Europe rubber and quinine. Um, so his, his expedition inspired Humboldt to want to go there. Um, he was also inspired by people like Cooks, Naturalist, um, and, and was just generally inspired by anything. And he found uh, a young Frenchman to, to uh, accompany him, Aimé Bonplan, who you can see with him sitting in that uh, painting 
bottom right on the screen, um, which was painted years after they actually went. And apparently uh, Humboldt was very critical of it, uh, not because it showed Humboldt in a poor light, but because the uh, instruments weren't painted correctly. Um, he took all sorts of instruments with him. He was forever measuring. Um, he came from quite a wealthy family, uh, but spent half of his, of his inheritance on his four-year trip. Um, he wrote uh, about three to 5,000 letters a year, and he received about 2,000 during his lifetime. Uh, he was fiercely anti-slavery. Uh, he called himself a historian of nature. Um, and his interests, I think what was unusual about Humboldt at the time was his interests really crossed boundaries. He wasn't just a scientist, he was a historian. He loved politics, economics, geography, uh, meteorology, anything like that. He was just fascinated by everything. Uh, he invented several things that we use today. He came up with the word Jurassic. He invented isotherms. And um, the term ecology, was made really to describe someone like him uh, because it comes from the Greek word for household and it means the science of the relationship of the organ organism with its, with its environment. Um, so, so let's just have a look at his first trip. Well, his, his only trip actually to Latin America and it was the major trip of his lifetime. Um, and um, it took four years, as I say, uh, 1799 um, to 1804. Um, he sailed across the Atlantic. He spent a lot of time in uh, the Canary Islands because he was very interested in volcanoes. Uh, so he was measuring their height. He was fascinated by how their height varied over the years. And he would look at paintings of different volcanoes and and. and from them, try and detect when they'd been painted quite successfully. Um, and they arrived in Venezuela today, Venezuela, then it was uh, called Nueva Granada, New Granada, um, and um, set off across the plains. And I think that's why Humboldt's always resonated with me because my first uh, uh, working part of my life was uh, living on the Venezuelan plains. I was um, a sort of cowboy's assistant uh, for. Um, four years or so. And uh, I honestly don't think things have changed much since Humboldt saw it. Um, and he was definitely one of the first scientists to get as far down as he did. It's not a great map, this, but you can just see he, he went down um, pretty much to the headwaters of the Amazon. Um, he discovered, um, well, he didn't discover, but he mapped uh, there's a channel in those swamp plans called the Cacifiari Channel, which actually, depending on the time of year, uh, flows either one way or the other and joins the Orinoco and the Amazon. So uh, ge ge geographically, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, you could, th in theory, get in your canoe in the mouth of the Amazon, uh, paddle a lot and come out of the mouth of the Orinoco, which I suppose makes a large chunk of that bit of Latin America an island. Um, but uh, maybe not um, significant enough. And then they went to, where did they go after that? They, would, uh, they went to Cuba after that, rather strangely, and uh, uh, looked around Cuba. Then they came back to Cartagena, uh, landed there in Colombia, and did an overland trip right through uh, present-day Ecuador and uh, into Peru. He wrote a seven volume uh, uh, um, uh, description, uh, it took him 27 years, uh, uh, of this trip, but funnily enough it omits large parts of it, so we're not really quite sure what he got up to in, uh, in much of Peru, for example. Um, uh, but we know in detail what he did in Venezuela. Um, and he then went on to um, Mexico and then up to the US and caught a boat home. Because uh, he was, he was. Um, he, I don't think he had his own boat. He was, he was catching rides everywhere. Um, so that was his just overall route. And I just thought I'd show you um, some of the. This is Venezuela. All of this. This is the sort of scenery he would have been 
going through. Uh, he went across the plains, which I know some of you uh, in today's audience might recognize because you're in that picture in the footsteps of Humboldt, who would have known? Um, he saw uh, jaguars. Uh, he noted how they ate the turtles. He saw the capybaras. He definitely saw Orinoco crocodiles. And he went far south into um, current day Venezuela, past certainly that uh, tabletop mountain, uh, also known as a Tepui, which is called Altana, and actually has a horizontal cave right the way through it. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And that scenery uh, today is, is totally unchanged. When he got to um, the more uh, Inca influenced countries, of Ecuador and Peru. He sketched, made lots of sketches of the, the pottery and everything that he found. Uh, um, this is actually a Machu Picchu, which he wouldn't have been to because Harum Bingham only rediscovered it in 1911. Um, but he certainly made great notes of all the uh, plants uh, that were native to Latin America. And he, um, he brought back, um, actually I must, he brought back, I think, an enormous, yes, yes, 42 cases with 6,000 plant species. Um, he had 20 mules, uh, which were changed every 10 days just to carry all his <laughs> samples back with him. Um, those were some of the uh, 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 plants that were, that were uniquely Latin American. Uh, he would definitely have visited this spot which is Inga Pirca in Ecuador which is at pretty much the northernmost range of the Inca Empire um, so he would have admired that um, um, but he is well known for his visit um, to Chimborazo volcano and this is a painting uh, depicting his 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 time there um, he and Bonplan uh, climbed up as far as they could uh, up Chimborazo, and they got to 19,286 feet, uh, which, at the, which of course he measured, um, at the time was um, a record for any um, person, to, uh, any human that we know about anyway, uh, which lasted for 30 years until um, Edward Wimper got to the top. He was the first person to climb uh, Chimborazo. So he um, his other claim to fame, oh yes, well there they are, those are some of his, the descendants of his mules, well they're not mules at all, of course, they're uh, llamas and alpacas, and some of the local inhabitants he would have met, who I'm sure are absolutely unchanged. And he ended up down on the coast, um, near, uh, north of Lima, uh, though he left from Lima in the end, um, and so these are just some pictures of those cultures, that's uh, Chan Chan, top left, um, bottom, sorry, uh, uh, under the sun, uh, Temple of the Sun, Chan Chan, bottom left, um, and uh, near Trujillo, um, some of the coastal Mochi and Chimu cultures, uh, evidence of which I guess he would have seen. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not sure if he went to Palenque, but these are some of the things he would have observed in Mexico, some of the Maya and Aztec. Uh, sites. And um, as you can see, he was a bit ahead of his time. When he got to uh, the US, he had a, a long meeting with Jefferson, the president, who was a, an acquaintance of his, probably the recipient of a few of his letters or something. Anyway, they got on very well then and thereafter. And uh, he said, suggested that uh, Panama might be quite a good place to dig a dig a channel between the Pacific and the Atlantic, um, which actually didn't take place for a further hundred years. Um, he also met Simon Bolivar, the uh, liberator of uh, much of the area through which he traveled, I would say called liberator, uh, because Gran Colombia was, was Simon Bolivar's uh, great dream, the five countries combined. Um, and Believer said of Humboldt that he was the true discoverer of the new world. Um, and um, anyway, then, then he came back. Oh, I've lost my, just, yeah. 
I just thought I'd show you this slide. You won't be able to read it in any detail, but it's, it's an illustration from one of his books. And it just shows the incredible detail he went into. It's, it's a volcano in the background, and it's got uh, one of Humboldt's ideas that hadn't really been thought of before was to do with habitat zones. And the fact uh, that if you went up, you know, the habitat was equivalent to going further from the equator. So that, that, that was um, one of his little uh, projects. And um, Latin America always remain, re remained in his memory very fondly. Um, I just put in a picture of those dolphins, which actually I think are in the, off the coast of Brazil somewhere. Um, uh, and an example of Humboldt's writing. So elegant, isn't it? Um, he, in his turn, uh, inspired many people, um, the great sort of romantic painters like Frederick Church, uh, who painted this in 1859, and uh, it's got a depiction of, of Chimborazo in the, in the background. Um, anyway, uh, he, he arrived back in, in, in Prussia and um, pretty short of money and uh, spent the rest of his inheritance uh, trying to publish things. As I said, 27 years he spent writing uh, that five-year trip up. Um, and um, uh, he, he wrote many more um, books afterwards, perhaps the most famous of which uh, is called Cosmos, uh, and was, again, his idea of uniting all the different sciences. He never finished it. He got to about volume five, I think, and uh, realized it was, it was a pretty endless, uh, endless job. Um, he, um, he had a stroke when he was 87, uh, but of course he, he documented all the symptoms, being Humboldt. And uh, he died in 1859, at just the time when Charles Darwin was drafting the first six chapters of Origin of Species. And um, it's, uh, Darwin, Darwin was definitely inspired by Humboldt. Uh, I, the, there's that wonderful paragraph at the end of Origin of Species about the entangled bank, which uh, uses very similar language to Humboldt um, and that sort of enthusiasm for nature. Um, of course, Darwin was, was using it to, to show other things as well uh, to do with evolution. Anyway, so that's Humboldt uh, in his Latin America terms. I'm now going to move on to Robert Fitzroy, um, who is a fascinating character. And I came across when I read a book uh, that I know some of you have read as well, which I'll, I'll give a little reading list at the end, uh, which described his, his tragic life, really, um, uh, weighed down by depression. Um, but what achievements. He, like, um, like Humboldt, was um, meteorology, was one of his absolute passions. He also was of independent means. I think he was the fourth grandson of Charles II or something, so quite grandly, grandly born. Um, he entered Naval College at the age of 12 at Plymouth, as, as he did then, went to sea at 14. Um, and the Beagle, which is depicted in that little, um, uh, engraving there, um, made two journeys to Latin America. Um, the first one, um, Fitzroy wasn't the captain initially, but uh, Stokes, who was, um, committed suicide in Patagonia. And Fitzroy was promoted to captain and did well. So when Beagle went on her second voyage, um, he was the captain. Um, on that first voyage, interestingly enough, because it, it, it'll come back when we talk about musters, um, they went to Tierra del Fuego and uh, they passed through Walaya Bay, which is that bottom picture, um, where they found um, some native uh, Fuegians. Um, and um, in the sort of um, manner of the time, uh, decided to take them back to London uh, to uh, educate them. Um, uh, what did he say? To civilize them. 
and to teach them the plainer truths of Christianity. I think the idea was that then they would be uh, sent, taken back to Tierra del Fuego and might in some miraculous way uh, convert the natives to, um, to a more European way of, of working. Well, of course, it ended in tragedy. Um, there were four Fuegians who um, um, Fitzroy and his crew acquired. Um, one was called Fuegia Basket because her coracle looked a bit like a basket. Uh, Jeremy Button, who I think was bought for buttons, that's why they called him that. The crew gave them their names. York Minster, because they found him near a rock that looked a bit like York Minster. And Boat Memory, who sadly died on the voyage. Um, and, um, but the, the first three did make it back in the end to Tierra del Fuego. Um, and apart from Fuegia Basket, who did leave to, live to a great age, uh, I don't, the others immediately um, reverted to their, their previous lives, which was probably the only way to survive. Um, and um, so not a successful project. Anyway, on the second voyage of the Beagle, and here is a little map showing its route, which was 1831 to 36, so five years. Um, Fitzroy was, was the captain and he uh, also actually funded much of the trip because I think that's how things worked then. Um, and he was looking for a suitable gentleman companion. Um, and that's when uh, Charles Darwin um, uh, was a chosen, uh, he was 22 at the time. But importantly for Fitzroy, apart from being a naturalist, um, was also of independent means and could pay his own way. So they had an eventful time. Of course, today, in Darwinian terms, it's mainly known for Darwin's time in, in, in Galapagos, but they went all the way, they too went to Cape Verde, probably measured a volcano, um, went all the way down the coast of Brazil, uh, Montevideo was a key spot they stopped at, um, and, and the Galapagos, obviously. Um, Fitzroy was a fiery character. Uh, he was known as hot coffee, apparently, by the crew. Um, he was also an incredibly reserved person. Uh, when uh, Fitzroy got back at the end of the... Um, the, the voyage, he almost immediately got married to a girl uh, who he'd been engaged to um, for, the, for the five years, well, for more than the five years. Darwin, he hadn't even told Darwin he was engaged. So there you are, that's how uh, uptight he was. And Beagle was only 90 feet long, so they were cooped up in, in confined quarters with 70 other people uh, for a very long time. Uh, the objective of the second voyage was mapping, and, uh, um, and Fitzroy, like Humboldt, was a real scientist and very um, exact in everything he did. Uh, you can, in fact, see on that uh, route, he mapped his way around Latin America. He then merely circumnavigated the globe, uh, went to uh, Australia, uh, Cape Town, and then came back to Bahia in Brazil because he wasn't quite sure about some of the measurements he'd done there. So he just diverted back to Brazil to redo them before they returned home. And um, this is just some of the scenery they would have gone past. Um, this is the what they call the green coast of Brazil between um, Rio and São Paulo, which they would have passed. And then as they went down the Atlantic coast of Latin America, uh, they would have come across their first um, Magellanic penguins, which those are, um, and oyster catchers and the elephant seal. And I'm not sure of their dates, whether or not they would have seen the southern right whales, which gather to breed in the um, Valdez Peninsula, but um, quite possible. And then further south, uh, this is just going around the tip of Latin America. So on the big picture, you can see um, what's now known really is, is the Beagle Channel. 
Um, that's a, a, an arm of it and that's the Pier Glacier, which takes you through in a very protected way through the, um, to avoid going around into the open ocean. And at um, Punta Arenas, uh, or Sandy Point, as it was probably called then. Um, well, no, Sandy Point hadn't even been founded then, but uh, uh, there is today a reproduction of the Beagle. So I thought I'd uh, pop that in. Rather nice little, um, little museum, which has a reproduction of the Beagle and also uh, a reproduction of the uh, Victoria, which was Magellan's ship. And I think you can see there how small they, they were. Um, and then top right, you have the uh, rather jaunty symbol that the Chileans have made at, uh, at, at Cape Horn. Uh, and then moving on round the, uh, round the corner a bit, starting to go up the Pacific coast, they wouldn't have got to Torres del Paine National Park, which is what this, this is. And in fact, I don't think even Muster's got there, but uh, I might be corrected on that one, uh, <laughs> but I thought I'd put a picture of it anyway because it's so pretty. Uh, they did sail up the western coast uh, and they would almost certainly have seen this glacier. This is the San Rafael glacier, uh, which is one of the only one in Latin America that comes off the southern Patagonic um, ice cap and goes straight into salt water. Um, so, um, that must have impressed them. And then they arrived um, in the Galapagos, which was one of the things they'd been asked, one of the places they'd been asked to map. Uh, so there they are in the Galapagos, and see the ancestors of those sea lions, I'm sure, would have been there to see them. Now, uh, the Galapagos then, and now, I guess physically, uh, very little has changed. Um, there is now, obviously, a human population uh, which there wasn't at the time that, um, that they visited. And um, the um, only, uh, uh, there are only a few islands that have uh, springs, uh, water on, and that was the main reason why sailors went to the Galapagos. If I just um, show you this page, um, I thought I'd put a few interesting dates up. Um, Zhu Man in 1421. This is the Chinese uh, admiral who, um, if you believe some theories, uh, sailed right around the globe and visited Latin America and Antarctica, all the rest of it. Um, uh, uh, and then there are stories that maybe the Inca Tupac Yupanqui went to the Galapagos, that if he did, would have been 1485. Again, very little evidence for any of this. I just put Columbus in there, he didn't, he didn't go to the Galapagos but he went to, he, to Latin America, South America for the first time in 1492. Um, the first definite European visitor to the Galapagos was this monk, Fray Tomás de Belanga, uh, who went there in, in 1535. And um, Ambrose Cowley uh, was a British buccaneer who we know was there in 1684. Um, and then several hundred years, really, until Fitzroy and Darwin's visit. So the islands were known about as a strategic point, but no one had the idea that they might possibly want to live there. Um, I guess that changed when, uh, after, shortly after Pearl Harbor, when the US were looking for, um, uh, realized the Japanese might, uh, might attack and were looking for ways to defend themselves and built a, an enormous runway on the Galapagos, on one of the islands, on Baltra, um, so they could protect the Panama Canal. So there's a little bit of a timeline on the Galapagos. Um, and um, I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures. This is um, a lava waterfall. Rather amazing, isn't it? Um, and a quote from Fray Tomas, Fray Tomas. Um, and I think you can understand why he might uh, say that uh, God had caused it to rain stones. It is uh, a beautiful but very um, rugged place. And it is full of geology, which I'm sure is what fascinated uh, Darwin. Um, that's a tuft cone in the background, Daphne Island. Um, and and uh, that is a cave where early pirates, uh, it's a soft sort of soapstone rock, I gather, 
uh, early, early pirates had used that as a shelter and conveniently made themselves some benches. Um, and then, of course, there's the wildlife. And I think one of the um, interesting thing about uh, the Galapagos and the reason, one of the reasons that Darwin um, found a visit there so useful is actually there are very few species. There are only about uh, 50 or so animal species on Galapagos. And if you compare that with Colombia, for example, mainland Latin America, which has uh, 1800, uh, you can see that observing differences between similar species, I guess, is, is easier, isn't it? Um, so, um, so that was a blue-footed booby. Um, and the wildlife is as tame today as it was then. The only threat really to it had been to the giant tortoises, which um, were very convenient to the sailors because they could be loaded onto the ships, turned upside down and provided uh, a food source um, for um, some time to come. Um, and of course, the Galapagos today, we now know, is uh, as important underwater as it is above. Um, that the um, hammerhead sharks, which are being studied by several groups of scientists at the moment, um, congregate there. I think we're gradually working out why. Um, but a fantastic sight, isn't it? Uh, waved albatross. And the northernmost penguins, the Galapagos penguins in the world. And the famous marine iguana, the, um, which uh, uh, evolved from a land iguana and is only found on the Galapagos. And another well-known species who's made it to the Galapagos there. Um, Sir David examining a finch, I think. Um, and that, I just put in that slide to highlight some of the great um, conservation work that is going on. Um, the giant tortoises are being bred in several places on Galapagos and reintroduced, reintroduced to places where they have been made extinct. This is a lovely project on Isabella Island um, where uh, the school children are given a care of a particular little young tortoise and uh, nurse it through its early um, early life and the important section of their uh, length of their life uh, when they need care coincides, coincides luckily with how long the kids are at school. So, um, so it works really well. Uh, that's the Mary Ann boat. Um, so plenty of ropes, I guess. I guess Fitzroy would have recognised a few of the ropes, if not some of the fancy metal work. Um, and um, so that, that was the Galapagos. But funnily enough, um, Darwin did spend, in those five years, he spent uh, three of them ashore. He made several excursions, particularly into Patagonia. Um, and he met the infamous uh, Rosses, who was uh, 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 in charge of a 50-year, really. At that point, he was starting a 50-year campaign of eradication of the uh, native peoples. Uh, Darwin rather took to him, but I think changed his mind when he heard what he'd done afterwards. Um, and after that journey, uh, The Origin of Species was uh, finally published in November 1859. Um, um, Fitzroy uh, uh, then went on to become governor, governor of New Zealand. Um, he had to deal with, um, again, problems managing the interaction between colonists, uh, settlers, and the native people there. Um, and, um, but he never really, uh, 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 he always struggled with his depression and uh, committed suicide in the end in 1865, um, which uh, a tragic end to a, to a wonderful life. Now, I just thought I'd add in a couple of short uh, characters. Uh, I won't say very much on either of them, but I just found them fascinating. Um, George Musters um, was uh, in the area inspired by Darwin. 
Um, he was a young man, younger son, uh, English, <clears throat> though he was born in Naples. He was orphaned at four. He joined the Navy at 13, had lots of parallels, therefore, with Fitzroy. Uh, he served on HMS Stromboli off the coast of Latin America um, for uh, five or six years. And I'm not quite sure what life was like then, but he ended up with a patch of land in Uruguay and a few sheep. So I think he rather, he rather took to it. And he reached the age of uh, the, uh, uh, the rank of commander uh, at a very young age, uh, in his 20s. Anyway, he'd read Darwin and Fitzroy's works and was determined to explore Patagonia. So um, he took half pay. And, um, and set off. And he traveled, he, he hitched a ride south to, um, to Punta Arenas, Sandy Point, which had been founded at that point. Um, and his plan was to link up with the native Indians, Tewelche mainly, which are the, 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 the Indians north of Tierra Fuego on the mainland, the, the southern Tewelches, and uh, nomadic, um, tribe who had first been spotted by Magellan, uh, whatever it is, 300 or so years earlier, um, and uh, when they were wearing, well, theory goes they might have been wearing some skin, uh, skins on their feet, which made their footprints look really big. That's one reason why they might have been called big-feeted people, uh, or Patagonis. Um, but it, it's also fairly likely that they were large and tall people, certainly compared to, to the early Spanish travellers and Portuguese travellers of their day, who tended to be a lot shorter, as, as did the, uh, the English, I think. Anyway, um, they were, when Magellan arrived, they were definitely still in a very Stone Age uh, existence. They were using um, stone arrows, um, uh, to hunt their prey, uh, although the Tehuelche, the, the, certainly the mainland people, had invented this, this whirling, the bolas, uh, as, a, as a means to catch um, prey like the guanaco at the bottom there, um, or the South American ostrich, the rhea. Um, now the big change came when the Spanish um, let a few horses go and um, or probably gave them to the Indians. I'm not exactly quite sure what, how history worked in that way. Uh, but they immediately realized that here was a fantastic improvement to their hunting methods. They pretty much stopped using arrows and uh, but became consummate horsemen. And of course, those of their um, uh, tri uh, tribal sort of neighbors in the north who were near Buenos Aires uh, are, together with uh, a, a few local people, what have formed today's gauchos. Uh, you know, that is, that's their original breeding. Anyway, Musters took this incredible route. It took him nearly two years. Um, he wasn't, um, he wasn't, he, he had some pretty close shaves. Uh, the, the local people had a very different, different attitude to life and death. Um, but he seems to, for whatever reason, have, have got on really well with them. And um, I've just read his book, um, At Home with Patagonians, and it's just a fascinating story of a world that no longer exists because the landscape is still there, but the people really aren't. Um, uh, they were effectively wiped out by the campaign of the desert, by drink and by disease. Um, Musters, in the end, um, emerged um, on the back at the Atlantic coast and, um, and returned uh, via Bolivia, I think, um, to England, married and died tragically uh, very young. Um, I, don't, I don't know what of. Um, he visited Lake Nawal Wapi, uh, which is the lake, big, beautiful lake near Bariloche. Uh, so I'm guessing he would have been one of the first English people to visit that lake, uh, more of anon. Um, uh, so there you are, a brief look at Masters, and I thought I'd just, that's an engraving from his book um, with the um, hunting the guanaco and the ostrich.
um, which is quite um, quite graphic. They, they they made a large circle with fire to to draw the um, the Guanacos into a central area where they could gather them. But gosh, that must have been a tough existence, particularly before the horse. Now the other person I've just thrown in as a little bonus here is Perito Moreno, because if you're Argentine, he is a, a, a heroic uh, a figure in your history. Um, and he is an interesting character. Um, he uh, was slightly um, younger than Musters. He uh, lived a much longer life. Um, and he also was really fond of the local Indian people and did several uh, expeditions into the area of mid uh, Patagonia, well, all over South America, but his, his, the ones he's written about um, uh, were into Patagonia. Um, and he loved, a bit like Humboldt, he just loved everything. He particularly loved fossils. So um, I thought I'd put it, there's Lake Nawal Huapi, top right. He called himself the first Argentine to to visit the lake. Uh, Musters had been there before uh, and a chap called uh, Cox uh, had probably come over from Chile, had definitely come over from Chile um, before, but he was the first Argentine, he says, to visit it. And it wasn't a simple task then. Most people, a lot of people were, were killed by the, by the Indians. Um, and um, so there it is, he also, uh, the the Elingasson, that was the um, uh, uh, sort of Indian evil spirit. And that's interesting because Brito Moreno, Brito just means um, expert. So uh, uh, expert Moreno, his real name, his Christian name was Francisco. Um, and um, he also was a man of, um, of independent means pretty much. Um, but he loved fossils. And in fact, there's a wonderful museum just outside uh, Buenos Aires in a place called La Plata, uh, which today, which he founded, and where that photograph bottom right was taken. And um, they probably are the creatures, they're each about the size of a sort of small car. Um, they probably are the creatures that uh, the natives uh, had known before they became extinct about uh, 8,000 years ago. Uh, and still, they still remained in their mythology. Uh, they're glyptodonts, that's what we call them today. And I thought I'd just put in a picture of a more recent fossil, which is the famous Patagotitan femur uh, being excavated uh, on the Atlantic coast near Trudeau. This is the biggest dinosaur yet discovered, <laughs> uh, 70 meters or something. Um, anyway, um, Fitzroy, uh, sorry, Fitzroy, uh, Perito Moreno, uh, the glaciers named after him, uh, he was really instrumental in gaining Argentina a lot of territory. Um, Chile and Argentina have always fought like mad over their border. And the initial idea when the maps weren't very good was that it would be defined by the watershed and that any, so if water ran into the Pacific, it would be Chile's, and if it ran into the Atlantic, it would be Argentina's. Well, Perito Moreno uh, soon realized when he went down there that there were plenty of big rivers in Argentina that sort of did a bit of a U-turn and went and, and ran out into the Pacific and didn't go to the Atlantic at all. And um, it, it turns out the South American plate had sort of done a bit of a, a, a tilt and uh, that's why this has happened. And he provided evidence to this uh, when in 1901, I think, uh, that particular dispute was uh, resolved in London uh, by the king, uh, but with um, uh, Perito Moreno's evidence. Um, and uh, he too loved Fitzroy, he was, uh, Fitzroy was a great hero, and he named uh, that mountain range, top left, uh, the Fitzroy. Uh, he, he put that name on it. Um, and, and today it is the National Park on the Argentine side near Torres del Paine. Uh, the picture top right is the Limay Valley near Bariloche, really pretty, probably very unchanged since um, they were there. The picture bottom left is also those peaks in the distance of the, of the Fitzroy peaks uh, and those imported um, 
cypress trees just show you perhaps how windy it is in Patagonia. And then bottom right, lovely autumn colours, and that hasn't changed at all. Um, the Perito Moreno's very own um, glacier there now, top left. Um, top right, uh, just an idea of how arid it is, uh, yet beautiful as you go away from the Andes uh, out into the Patagonian steppe. Um, bottom left, you can see the Guanacos have survived the depredations, uh, survived very successfully the depredations. Uh, bottom right, that's the beautiful Lanine volcano, um, near which this December uh, a total solar eclipse is going to pass. And uh, I know I'm hoping to be there together with some of you in this audience. And um, I just thought I'd better put in a picture of uh, a modern place you can actually stay at uh, while you look at all this wonderful um, scenery. Um, so um, I guess um, Preacher Moreno was an idealist. He loved the Indian people, but he also wanted development. And I'm afraid it's development that hasn't gone, uh, hasn't been compatible with their survival. Um, and one of the terms he came up with was that there, uh, when the Indians were criticized uh, for killing people, he said their brutality is no match for our own. Um, anyway, uh, I think I'm near at the end. I've, I've got a little book list coming up for you in a minute. Um, that is the Fitzroy Peak. Yes, a short reading list if anyone's interested and uh, don't scribble it down if you don't want to because I'm sure I could let you know uh, by email or something. Um, this Thing of Darkness is the wonderfully written book uh, about Fitzroy. It's slightly fictionalized in places, but it really does bring his, his life to life. Uh, Masters's book, At Home with the Patagonians, is a reprint of the book as he wrote it in, in um, 18 whenever it was. Um, but he writes really, really well, and the stories he has to tell are amazing. Um, the Andrea Wolf book, is new, uh, newish, I think about five years or so ago, uh, a, a biography of Humboldt. If you read anything by Humboldt, he sort of, you start with seven volumes, so it's difficult. Uh, but this is a you know, small paperback. It's uh, easily consumable and uh, with great, great stories. And if you want to read something by Humboldt, I think the only thing that's vaguely accessible is this, um, his, a new translation of, of one of his books, um, Views of Nature. Um, here we are, Views of Nature, um, where he writes um, seven essays on seven completely different subjects. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. And um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions, uh, I can deal with them. And if not, I'll tell you what's happening next time.